the 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 big news uh, following uh, the significant Ukrainian victories in Russia, the sig- significant pushback uh, where the Ukrainian the the Russians basically had to fold and and exit uh, the whole province of Kharkiv, uh, where the Ukrainians in a matter of days uh, reoccupied that territory uh, very quickly and did for devastating results uh, for the Russians. I mean. Not only were, were thousands of, of, of Russians killed, uh, tens of thousands were captured, or thousands were captured, uh, and uh, probably tens of thousands basically taken out of the fight, but also hundreds of weapons were captured from tanks to um, uh, all kinds of, uh, uh, you know, all kinds of uh, mobile, uh, you know, transportation vehicles, and, uh, and not to mention weapons and shells and tank shells and and just uh, just ammunition and everything else. All of that were ca- captured by the Ukrainians, set set back the Russians significantly, um, and uh, and and I think it's emboldened the Ukrainians. The Ukrainians are still kind of chipping away very very slowly at Russian positions in the south. It's not clear when the Ukrainians or if the Ukrainians can launch a significant push in the south. The Ukrainians are also trying to push against uh, the Russians uh, in the northeast and around Lehman, I think it's called Lehman, Lehman, uh, and and trying to uh, basically get away. The Russians have held it till, since 2014, really, and they're really well established and, and they're really well dug in. But other than that, um, you know, it's, it was it was a it was a great few weeks for the Ukrainians, in terms of just humiliating the mighty Russian army. The mighty Russian army. I mean, if anybody has any delusions about the Russian army, I think they're gone now. Um, Putin's response to this uh, last week was uh, to announce a mobilization of forces, uh, three hundred thousand reserves uh, that had not been mobilized. Uh, add them, although. I'm I'm reading in some places that that uh, the way the Russian authorities have taken Putin's thing, it's not three hundred thousand. They're actually trying to trying to enlist somewhere around one point two million people. Um, the consequence of this announcement that they were going to enlist a whole bunch of people and call up the reserves has been panic uh, in uh, in in Russia, um, a, a, a massive attempt at exodus. Uh, men just trying to men who are uh, eligible to be called up through this uh, through this call up of the reserves uh, trying to exit the country uh, whether to places like Finland uh, every ticket out of Moscow in an airplane was booked up uh, airplanes full of males just trying to get out of the city uh, out of the country uh, but beyond that uh, what you're seeing also demonstrations in the streets demonstrations in Moscow and St Petersburg and in many other, cities around Russia, uh, also in the Caucasus or in some of the independent autonomous regions of Russia where ethnic minorities, uh, where ethnic minorities control it. And um, uh, they are there trying to, uh, uh, you know, refusing in a sense to cooperate with the Moscow authorities in terms of, uh, in terms of enlisting people. Uh, they're saying, you know, what is Moscow, what have these Russians have done for us lately? As I predicted, the, there's more and more talk about some of these uh, ethnic groups trying to establish autonomy. The Chechens, for example, uh, Chechens have fought two wars with Russia, lost them, but have fought two bloody wars against Russia to try to establish the independence for which they were lost. The Chechens, who are led by a guy who is very, very much a uh, an ally of Putin, but this guy's basically said, we're not going to pay any attention to this uh, call up. We're not going to enlist people. Um, we're not going to play go- ball with the with the with the people in Moscow. Uh, we're holding back for now. We want to see. We want to see if if the Kremlin is serious about this. And again, I think what could happen is you could have ha- see an internal breakup of Russia from the inside. You can see the Chechens trying to fight for their independence. You can see some of these other ethnic groups trying to fight for their independence and Russia kind of imploding uh, from the inside. Um, but Putin is obviously in an in a unbelievably weak position. Everything he has argued, everything he has claimed, 
everything is stood for uh, is really is really uh, collapsed. Uh, the the regime thought that they could take out the Ukrainians in three days. They thought they would be able to take Kiev and replace Zelensky with a pro-Russian uh, president to just get on with life. Uh, I don't think Russia thought they would have to uh, uh, permanently occupy vast territories in order to, in order to for them to succeed in this war. I don't think the Russians expected to lose anywhere between fifty to eighty thousand uh, soldiers, either uh, by through death or through just injury. Uh, I don't think the Russians thought they would be humiliated on the battlefield. I don't think they thought they would lose as many tanks and as many armored vehicles as they have, uh, and many airplanes. Uh, I mean, at every uh, in every sense, this has been devastating for Russia. But beyond that, I don't think the Russians thought that as a consequence of this of this war, uh, Finland and Sweden would join NATO, which I think is probably the most devastating of all the consequences. Um, for uh, for Russia. I mean, the fact is that they went into Ukraine to prevent Ukraine from joining NATO. Well, they got a lot worse than that. They got, they got you know, uh, much more powerful enemies now in uh, Finland and Sweden, now committed to NATO. Uh, long, long border with Russia. Uh, two countries that have militaries that are far more powerful than the Ukrainian military. So this has been a devastating, and, and of course the, the Russian economy has de- been devastated. They've had a massive brain drain, and now they're losing even more, uh, you know, primarily men uh, leaving Russia. So it's, a, it's, it's, a, it's an even greater brain drain on the Russian economy. So Russia, Russia's uh, struggling. Uh, Putin is struggling. Um, it, all of his actions now are out of desperation. Of course, uh, as part of uh, the mobilization, Putin has threatened to use nuclear weapons. Uh, that, again, is an act of uh, ultimate desperation. I hope, I don't know this for a fact, but I certainly hope uh, that the generals within the Russian army and others surrounding Putin will refuse to launch nuclear weapons, even if Putin is crazy and suicidal enough to actually do it. Uh, I think there are probably people around him who, who will stop him. Maybe not, which is kind of spooky and scary, but it, but I guess it is possible that uh, we will see the use of a tactical nuclear bomb uh, in Russia. Um, so, uh, you know, all we're seeing is a desperate regime, a regime desperate for attention, a regime desperate for some form of victory, a, a regime desperate for soldiers, for weapons, for, for anything. Uh, this is a regime, of course, buying weapons from the Iranians and the North Koreans, of all people. That's their allies now. That's how isolated Russia has become. The Chinese, while somewhat sympathetic to the Russians, won't give them weapons and are not sharing you know, military technology with them. Uh, the Indians are not giving them weapons and military technology. Both countries are buying oil and gas, primarily oil, from Russia, but they're not militarily supporting them. So it, what you're seeing is Russia further isolated, further desperate, Putin um, not knowing where to turn to, not willing to give up, uh, not cannot, he can't admit defeat, so just becoming more and more desperate. And of course, the fear is and, the, and the, the real risk is that as he becomes more and more and more desperate, um, that he becomes, uh, that he becomes, uh, uh, more and more of a, of, of a risk of uh, actually launching, um, uh, you know, uh, actually launching a nu- nuclear attack. Um, Jeff asks, and again, I'm jumping to Jeff just because he's asking a question about the topic we're talking about right now. So Jeff asks, uh, says, uh, Putin and everyone is evil for initiating conscription. Zelensky did the same thing. It was terrible watching Ukrainian men fighting age, having to leave their families at the border and go back to defend their country. It was, although although those pictures, many of them were doing it voluntarily. Some of them obviously were not. Uh, but yes, conscription is awful. It's horrific. It's anti-individual rights. It's evil. Um, but again, I, I, I wouldn't con- compare uh, a country doing it out of a sense of desperation and self-defense and a country doing it in order to invade another country. 
So conscription is evil and bad. It's evil and bad in Ukraine. It's evil and bad in Israel. I served three years under conscription. So I know personally the evil of it and the damage it does to and the wasted time and life. The only good thing to come out of my army service is that I met my wife there. Um, but it's evil in Israel. It's horrible in Israel. And, and uh, uh, one of the things we do in Israel is, is uh, Boaz Arad, who runs the Ayn Rand Center Israel and who is a good friend of mine, has been a friend of mine since the uh, early 80s. Um, uh, one of his programs as part of the Ayn Rand Center is uh, a program about privatization of the of the Israeli military and uh, ending the draft and, and ending the draft and um, uh, and embracing a private professional army for Israel. He's got some former generals on his side. He has testified in, in the, the Knesset and everywhere else. So I do not think Israel is an exception. Absolutely, I think, I think Israel should uh, eliminate the draft. I've said this many, 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 many times, so this is not something new. Um, if you know anything about me, you know I'm against the draft everywhere, so it's just a, another knock against some people on the chat who are trying to attribute to me ideas that I don't have. Um, I've always said that a country that cannot raise a voluntary army to defend itself is a country that does not deserve to exist. I think that is true of Ukraine. I think that is true of Israel. I think that is true of every country. So um, um, it, it is evil of all these countries, but it is, if you will, more evil when you're raising that army in order to invade another country, in order to initiate force. The initiation of force is, is, is just horrific because then you're not only doing damage to your own people by initiating force against them and conscripting them, then you're putting them in real harm's way um, and you're initiating that, and you're putting everybody else in harm's way. You, 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 you're putting everybody, you're attacking in harm's way as well. So the real evil here is on the Russian side, although, yes, conscription is evil, no question about it. Um, all right, let's, um, let's keep going. Um, yes, yeah, so, so uh, I'm, I'm encouraged to see, and I keep getting more encouraged to see uh, more and more the, the resistance in Russia to um, the mobilization, to the conscription, to uh, 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 you know, bringing, uh, forcing people to join the military. I don't know if you know this, but some of the anti-war protesters, um, uh, you know, it's like in England in, in I think the 18th century, you know, sometimes the, the sailors would kidnap people and enlist them in the army and they would be part of the Navy. Uh, if you were drunk or something like this, they, they would enlist you. Uh, what's happening right now in Russia is is some of these anti-war demonstrations. They're literally taking people off the streets and and forcing them into military uniforms. They're forcing them into the into the military um, as punishment for being anti-war. Of course, um, these are not going to be motivated soldiers. These are not going to be successful soldiers. These are going to be just cannon fodder. So it's horrible and tragic, but it's not going to solve Putin's problem. Putin's problems are far deeper than having more bodies. Uh, he doesn't have enough trained soldiers. He ne doesn't have enough motivated soldiers. He doesn't have enough uh, people who actually motivate to win. He has lousy strategy. He has lousy generals. He has lousy weapon systems. I mean, the Russian military is incompetent, and having another 300,000 troops is not going to change the fact that they're incompetent. Russian soldiers are unmotivated to fight. Having 300,000 additional unmotivated soldiers is not going to change the outcome. Russia is in trouble, you know, through and through. In every aspect of this, Russia is in, uh, in, in, uh, is in a disaster zone for itself. Troy, thank you. Uh, Troy waiting in uh, to get us over the uh, 650 target. Really appreciate it, Troy. With 500 Australian dollars, uh, that's great. Uh, thank you. And you can ask a question sometime. <laughs> um, but it's it's great to have your support. Uh, so, uh, you know, just disaster for Russia. What can we say? Disaster for Putin. Uh, but Putin's in a corner. He's becoming more and more desperate, which, uh, which does not bode well for anybody, it, particularly for the Russians. The Russians are going to be the biggest victims of all of this. And the Russians are already suffering. Uh, I wish, I wish uh, countries like America uh, opened doors to anybody fleeing Russia right now. Uh, imagine the brain drain out. I was just talking to somebody here in Brazil who was living in Tbilisi for a few months, and he said he had to leave, leave Tbilisi 
because so many Russians had moved to Tbilisi to get away from Russia and away from Putin and away from the devastating economic consequence of what Putin's doing. Uh, they moved to Tbilisi and they've driven rents so high that nobody else can afford rents in Tbilisi. So uh, uh, Russians are going to places like Tbilisi, Georgia. They're going to places uh, like Turkey. Uh, but what would be great is if Western Europe and the United States opened its doors to fleeing Russians uh, and uh, brought that talent uh, to uh, where it can best manifest itself. Um, but, you know, immigration policy is so pathetic and ridiculous. That's not going to happen. Thank you for listening or watching the Iran Brooks Show. If you'd like to support the show, we make it as easy as possible for you to trade with me. You get value from listening. You get value from watching. Show your appreciation. You can do that by going to iranbookshow.com slash support, by going to Patreon, subscribe star, locals, and just making a appropriate contribution uh, on any one, of those, uh, any one of those channels. Also, if you'd like to see the Iran Book Show grow, please consider sharing our content. And of course, subscribe. Press that little bell button right down there on YouTube so that you get an announcement when we go live. And for you, those of you who are ready subscribers and those of you who are ready supporters of the show, thank you. I very much appreciate it.